Welcome and thank you for joining today's conference, United Kingdom's Preparedness and Delivery Model for a Highly Pathogenic Avian Influenza Outbreak. Before we begin, please ensure you have opened the chat panel by using the associated icon that's located at the bottom of your screen. If you require any technical assistance, please send a chat to the event producer. All audio lines have been muted for the duration of the call. To submit a written question, select all panelists from the drop-down menu in the chat panel, enter your question in the message box that's provided, and then send. With that, I'll turn the call over to Liz Fernandez. Liz, please go ahead. Good morning, everyone. Um, good morning to everybody on the East Coast, and good afternoon for everybody else who's all over those different time zones we're working with today. I'm Liz Fernandez with Professional People Training. And I'd also like to welcome you today. We have three speakers for today's webinar. Our first speaker is Matt Price. Matt has been delivering government biosecurity policies for the last 25 years. For the first 13 years of his career, he worked for the Australian Quarantine and Inspection Service, preventing tests and diseases entering the country. For the last 12 years, he has worked for the United Kingdom's Animal and Plant Health Agency and is the lead on preparedness for responding to exotic animal disease outbreaks essentially coordinating the teams and contractors that deal with disease and pest incursions should they breach the border. Matt represents the UK in a number of international forums, including the Quad Network, of which a number of US colleagues also participate. Our second speaker is Gordon Sammet. Gordon is the commercial director and one of the founders of LiveTech Systems. Established in 2010, LiveTech has grown in the UK's market, leading on on-farm population service provider with an international customer base. Gordon has over 18 years direct experience in providing on-farm depopulation services. Following the outbreak of foot and mouth disease in 2002, Gordon worked to redefine the commercial delivery model, notifiable disease outbreaks, for the UK's Department for Environment, Food, and Rural Affairs. This experience has given Gordon an in-depth knowledge and direct involvement in the successful delivery of all avian disease outbreaks. And our last speaker is Andrew Ballantine. Andrew is the head of Turkey Operations for the Hook 2 Sister and PD Hook Group. Andrew has over 40 years experience in agriculture, 30 years experience with chickens, and over 10 years in turkey production. He has an extensive experience in hatching, breeding, growing, and seed milling functions. His chicken experience was initially with GW Padley Limited and then general manager for Moy Park GB for some 30 years. He's the agricultural director for Bernard Matthews and for the last four years, head of turkey operations for PD Hook and Hook Two Sisters Group. And with that, I'm gonna turn the webinar over to Matt Price. Good morning, Liz, and good morning, everyone, and thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak to you today. So um, I'll be talking about the United Kingdom's approach to dealing with notifiable avian disease, um, and also be talking about the work that the Animal and Plant Health Agency, that's APHA, does uh, across um, the delivery network that we operate under. We'll be talking a little bit about the 2020-21 avian influenza outbreak, and at this point I should say some of my information is now a little bit out of date as we confirmed two new premises over the weekend. And I'll also be talking a little bit around uh, the approach the UK takes to controlling animal disease. Um, and as our host has said, um, we will be taking questions in the chat and uh, we'll be more than happy um, after the presentations have been done. Um, so first off, a little bit to explain who APHA are. So we're a, an executive agency of DEFRA. DEFRA is the Department for Environment, Food and Rural Affairs. And we work across uh, the, uh, the nations of Great Britain, which includes um, Scotland and Wales, to deliver their animal health and welfare policies. So when we talk about Great Britain, we're talking about the three countries of England, Scotland and Wales. And when we talk about the United Kingdom, we're also including in there uh, Northern Ireland. Uh, it's important to say that as part of this presentation, uh, Northern Ireland deliver their own animal health and welfare policies uh, through their own department called DARA. But that's just to give you a little bit of an understanding, I guess, of, of how um, APHA fits into the picture. Um, each country has a chief veterinary officer, but when we talk about uh, the UK on the national stage, we're uh, represented by the, the UK's chief officer, which is uh, Dr. Christine Middlemas. Uh, and so she, she represents the whole of the UK in international forums. Uh, each 
uh, administration, as I say, has their own chief vet, and the chief vet can um, apply uh, their own uh, policies in relation to animal health and welfare. Just remembering, though, that they need to be compliant with the UK's approach uh, to, to our trading partners. Um, so within DEFRA, my agency is responsible for, um, first of all, identifying when we have a pest or a disease um, entering the country, and this may even be prior to it entering. So this is about our risk scanning and uh, ho uh, horizon scanning we do. do. Um, but also then, what do we do if a pest or disease enters the UK? How do we mobilise our forces to, um, to um, get rid of it uh, in as quickly a time as possible? reducing the impact to wider society uh, and include things like um, environmental mitigations. So uh, APHA runs the National Reference Laboratory for Avian Influenza. Uh, while we were part of the EU, it was also an EU reference laboratory, uh, and that's at our Weybridge site. So that's the team that does all of the, um, the lab work that we do. But across our network, we've got a whole range of, of different people and teams uh, that we that are supporting our, our outbreak uh, response. Uh, my team is one of those. I sit within the contingency planning division and I'm required to uh, help the business understand the legal requirements that exist around um, our requirement to contingency plan and to respond to disease outbreaks. Part of this um, advice includes looking at uh, the training requirements that we need to implement across our team to ensure that we can respond to an outbreak. It's also looking at things um, around um, capability and, and um, understanding what sort of um, outbreaks we're able to respond to. Um, to help benchmark that, the United Kingdom has broken outbreaks into five categories. A category one outbreak is our most easy outbreak to deal with. It could be a single animal or single infected premises that we're dealing with, all the way up to what we call a Category 5 outbreak. And a, a Category 5 outbreak is based on our reasonable worst-case scenario of a, of a disease event happening. And as far as the United Kingdom is concerned, we very much look back to the, the 2001 foot and mouth outbreak. And, and as Gordon alluded to uh, in his uh, bio, he was involved in government at that time delivering some of those services. But to put things in perspective, uh, the 2001 FMD outbreak saw more than 6.5 million animals culled across uh, the UK. Uh, it was a direct cost to government of about three billion pounds and an estimated cost to the economy of, of six to nine billion. And um, so when we're doing our contingency planning, that's sort of what we define as what our reasonable worst case scenario looks like. And then we dial it back from there um, to understand what our capability is. And um, APHA is required to be able to respond up to what we call a category three outbreak. So a Category 3 outbreak is defined as up to 33 infected premises across Great Britain, and um, it is likely to um, uh, straddle the various administrations. So it could be in England or, and Scotland, or it could be England and Wales, etc. So that's a little bit about what my team do. And then uh, in the event of an outbreak, we, we pivot from being contingency planners, and we lead on the coordination of the outbreak response. And that's a really good segue into the avian influenza outbreak of 2020. Now, I'm aware that the, the United States had a large outbreak, I think, in 2015 or so. Um, we had a, a large outbreak in 2016-17, uh, but the current outbreak that we've got is by far the largest that we've had to deal with. Um, and as I said at the very start, some of my information is now a little dated because over the weekend we confirmed another two infected premises. So in total now, across the United Kingdom, we have had 27 infected premises. 25 of those premises have been affected by high pathogenic avian influenza, and the other two premises have been affected by low pathogenic avian influenza. Um, the majority of our infected premises were identified in England, with our first cases being detected on the 2nd of November. Uh, so between November and the end of December, we had a very uh, 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 intensive period of having to respond to um, cases uh, across um, England, Scotland and Wales. And 
um, that basically has led to us killing hundreds of thousands of birds and then also paying out um, several million pounds in compensation. So as far as this outbreak is compared or concerned, compared to our reasonable worst case scenario, it, it's, it's nowhere near what our reasonable worst case would look like for red meat species, uh, but it, it's certainly uh, been very challenging uh, for us to respond uh, across avian influenza for this sort of outbreak. Uh, remembering as well that we've also had to operate within um, the COVID-19 constraints. So this is around um, safe working environments uh, for not just our own um, direct employees, but for the contractors and the keepers that are also dealing um, with the outbreak. Uh, it's also important to remember that we've identified more than 310 dead wild birds that have been affected with disease. Now, um, that is part of our um, surveillance network that we have, and I'll come on to that a little bit towards uh, the end of my presentation. Um, but if people did want extra information about um, what the UK's approach is to dealing with the current outbreak, I've got the hyperlink there. Um, if you just searched in Google on and put the keywords in of, of DEFRA, avian influenza. Um, so just a little bit about background about the contingency planning process in the United Kingdom. So I mentioned each administration has its own chief vet and um, each administration also has its own contingency plan. And the contingency plan set out the command and control structures that would be applied in the event of an outbreak clearly describes the roles and responsibilities of all the people that will be involved in the response. And then to support the contingency plans, we publish something called Great Britain Disease Control Strategies. And again, at the end of the presentation, I've got hyperlinks um, which can later be accessed if people wanted to look further at the various um, pieces of information that we have out there for the members of the public. Um, now, it's also important to remember that your contingency plans need to be exercised. So when we don't have a real life response, like the avian influenza outbreak, we do have a scheduled series of um, exercises which we um, implement to try and um, exercise and to get people thinking about the issues and risks that they need to be dealing with in the event of a real outbreak. Um, one of our last national exercises, an exercise called Exercise Holly, has been um, derailed twice now, the first time due to COVID. It was going to be a face-to-face -face meeting. Uh, it was a tabletop exercise, and it was time to coincide with the um, OIE general session in France in May 2020, but of course COVID stopped that. Uh, and then our next exercise date was planned for November of uh, 2020, and again, it's this avian influenza outbreak uh, came along and again derailed it. Uh, we're currently planning to deliver our exercise uh, possibly by July this year, but that is still subject to the number of infected premises we're dealing with. So when we talk about the United Kingdom's approach to, to disease control, we talk about um, the gold, silver, bronze model or strategic, tactical and operational. So these are all the different groups um, that are formulating either the strategy, the tactics, or, or how we're actually delivering on the ground. And um, if you can see the National Disease Control Centre, that's the group that I sit in, and I translate uh, policy information and turn that into operational instructions, which can then be delivered through our Central Disease Control Centre, the CDEC, and also by the teams on the ground at the FOB, at the Forward Operating Base. And um, I also take information from those teams and I triage it and use it to feed back up into the, to the, uh, the NDEC level, which then goes off to feed other parts of the response across government. When we think about what our response looks like, this is just a very dirty diagram which shows just a very um, high level of uh, uh, with, as in doesn't go into much detail, but it shows the various teams across government, industry, uh, and other operational partners that we need to engage with. And that includes uh, people like the Department for Health, the Food Standards Agency, uh, the Environment Agency, so other government departments that are going to be concerned potentially by how we're dealing with a disease outbreak. So the Environment Agency, for instance, will want to be assured that the cleansing and disinfection processes that we're applying on site 
um, isn't adversely affecting the environment. Uh, and like, likewise with the public health authorities, they're really going to be interested to understand whether our use of uh, personal protective equipment and respiratory protective equipment is going to uh, reduce the human health um, impact of that disease. And just thinking about how, how our agency response works, if we look back um, to the finding from Russia uh, last month, uh, where H5N8 infection was detected in poultry workers. That uh, caused our public health authorities to review the risk, which in turn uh, required APHA to change the way we, we're dealing with the risk, uh, and we now require our staff and contractors to take antivirals and prophylaxis. Um, so that's a really good example of how um, in a response something might change quite rapidly and we use those uh, gold, silver, bronze structures to try and um, shift the information between the, the various agencies that are required to respond in order to deliver something um, quite rapidly and um, be updated in our sort of work instructions and process procedures. On farm, we've got a, uh, a dedicated case officer, so um, each infected premises across the country will we'll send a, a case officer to. And um, I should have said at the very start there, whenever we detect a, a premises with high pathogenic avian in influenza, rather than using the approach that some of the larger countries like the US and Australia do in relation to uh, the zoning, uh, we're very much still governed by the EU approach, and that requires uh, the, the competent authority to place a 10 kilometre zone around the infected premises and then that zone is broken down uh, into other zones which have different um, elements happening and that of those zones is the IP or the infected premises. So we've assigned a case officer to each infected premises and that infected, uh, uh, sorry, the case officer's responsibility then is to ensure that all of the other functions are being undertaken. So for instance, the, the valuation of the birds the culling of the birds, the biosecure transport and disposal of the birds, depending on the disease vaccination. So it, potentially we could vaccinate for zoo birds in an avian influenza outbreak. Uh, for Newcastle disease, we could also roll out a vaccination program out. And we also work quite closely with a wide range of other operational partners um, and third party uh, contractors on these sites. Um, and as I mentioned, so uh, LiveTech is a good example of one of the contractors that we work quite closely with. Um, we, we do work across um, a range of different providers though. Um, we've got a, a veterinary delivery partnership group uh, and that is a, a, a contractual arrangement we have uh, across a number of private veterinary practices that will provide us with um, information that will help us um, uh, sorry, um, I've lost my train of thought. Let me start again. Uh, sorry, yeah, they pr help us provide um, support to um, de delivering our normal veterinary requirements. And I, I just saw a question come in, sorry, about air exclusion zones. Uh, I should have said that air exclusion zones would be more used in a uh, disease situation where um, virus might be pluming, and uh, foot and mouth disease is a good example of that. But if we had a um, maybe a large uh, outdoor uh, production facility with, say, potentially emus or ostriches, that is an area where we might think of putting an air exclusion zone up to stop news helicopters and the like coming in to, to try and take pictures, which might in turn um, put our staff at risk through stampedes or things like that or disturbing the animals. Um, so uh, once we've used a company to, to cull the birds, we've also got to then um, move them in a biosecure manner. We don't want to transmit uh, disease as part of this operation. And um, so we generally use um, Arctic lorries. Uh, again, a little bit different to um, some of the other countries in the world. The United Kingdom has a really good um, capability in relation to um, commercial rendering. So we have about um, 20,000 tons of rendering capacity per week. And um, in the event of a, of a large scale outbreak, we would look to work with the industry to um, shift waste across their network in order to allow us to deal with the highest uh, level of, of, of risk within the waste. So before these 
trucks can be used. We do something called a leak test. Um, a thousand litres of water is tipped in. The lorry is tipped to a 30 degree angle and it's visually examined for leaks and then we, we pump the water out and a leak test certificate is issued. And when that vehicle arrives at farm, it's at the role of our case officer to check and verify that the truck has been leak tested and meets our requirements. Um, in order to get the truck there, we'll work closely with um, other, other um, government departments and a really good example is how we work with the National Police Chiefs Association. And um, that allows us to share the route that the truck is intending to travel and the police are then able to um, look at their information and provide us advice and guidance. Um, so for instance, uh, on one of the IPs we dealt with, uh, our route was going to be travelling near a large football game. And um, so the police were able to advise that there could be potential um, blockages uh, and were able to come up with a new route which we could then follow. Uh, and it's also important to remember that when we're doing these um, transports, we're tr um, escorting the vehicle to check that there are no uh, leaks or drips coming from it. I mentioned at the very start there that we do um, international disease monitoring and this is um, a, a really good website I'd, I'd direct you to look at as well. Um, and basically we do something called a preliminary outbreak assessment. So what we're doing is we're assessing all of the different disease reports. Some of those disease reports get entered into the uh, OIE's uh, WAHIS system, which is um, how they report on um, dead wild birds being positive for avian influenza. But We've also been able to tap into um, some of the EU networks through the Animal Disease Notification System. And this is just a snapshot um, from one of the preliminary outbreak assessments. And obviously by now that outbreak is far more than preliminary. Uh, what we can see is all of the, the findings there that have appeared in mainland Europe. And then to the top left you can see uh, the UK there. And the blue spots are the dead wild birds, the red spots are um, uh, commercial premises that have been come out and infected premises. And um, this sort of work is done uh, across all of the different diseases um, and it allows us to be able to share information with industry in advance of an outbreak to hopefully help them be prepared for when it does um, ultimately arrive in the United Kingdom. Um, on top of all the work we do, we all, as government, central government, we also fund research and, and um, which looks at different mechanisms and technologies that can um, improve animal health and welfare. And the information we're about to hear about the containerized gassing units, it's a really good example of how, um, first of all, the government, after the 2003 uh, avian influenza outbreak in the Netherlands, where about 30 million birds were culled, they got together to look at the various um, research that needed to be done to develop a humane and welfare culling method. Um, a lot of that research was funded both by uh, the UK and the Dutch governments through um, different learning institutes in the UK, and that is where some of this um, technology started to really uh, be developed. And from there, uh, the uh, APHA developed their own fleet of containerized gassing units. And for a good period of time, we were the only provider uh, able to provide that service direct to the industry when it was required. But over time, we've been working with uh, people like the Poultry Health and Welfare Group uh, and the various other industry representative groups to try and help industry take some of this responsibility for their own contingency planning. Uh, and, and therefore take some of the, the cost away from central government uh, in doing this work. Uh, and again, I've got the research portal there and um, if people were interested, they can uh, use the search facility to see what sorts of um, research we've undertaken uh, and then it will link you to the various uh, scientific reports and journals that that's appeared in. Um, as I said, there's a lot of different learning resources at the end of this um, uh, presentation. Uh, and people can go through those at their own time. Um, so at this point, I'll just say thank you for listening and I'll hand over now to Gordon Samet from LiveTech. Thank you. Thank you very much, Matt. Um, and uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, the, uh, just to, uh, yep, I've got the presenter. It's, um, as Liz quite rightly said, of Gordon Samet, I'm the commercial director and one of the founders of, of LiveTech Systems. Um, uh, over the next 
20 minutes, I'm, I'm going to just quickly cover over the um, on-farm depopulation aspect from the uh, effect, how the, from the contingency planning, um, how that links into and how that assists with any on-farm depopulation, um, and how we deliver the requirements with government, which is slightly different from a commercial perspective in how, what we've got to do. Um, and also, at the end, really, from, from our perspective as a, as a commercial organisation doing depopulation, how we contain the spread of any, any virus. Really, the one thing that we don't want is to, to exacerbate the, uh, already a very difficult situation. So we are um, to to uh, quickly go on. Well, okay, um, was was founded on the basis of a, of, of depopulation. I very quickly became the person, a very nice person that no one ever wanted to see again. Um, so obviously, we turned up at a very bad time. One of the things uh, that we have worked very hard to do with the company. Is, is to develop uh, the company into a, a much more than, than simply a depopulation, uh, depopulation company. That said, everything that, um, that, that LiveTech has driven, we, have, we now have a number of services, a number of products that we've developed, but everything that we do is scientifically based. So we do the research behind, behind the product that we, that we develop. So we have everything from um, a single, a single um, uh, animal device right up to to whole, whole house um, and whole site depopulations. So it's something that uh, we've worked very, very hard to do. But clearly, um, it's, it's, we are running effectively a, an emergency service. Um, and as a commercial organization, it's very difficult to, to, uh, to plan, uh, financially plan an emergency, an emergency service. So we're working with the industry as we do in the UK. Once we move focus to be, um, whilst key to the on farm depopulation, we were looking at how, from the information we were gathering with the depopulations we were taking, how could we better use that information to help the industry and actually not depopulate a site. So that's one of the things that we have been really focused on over the last number of years, is actually not becoming a depopulation service. Um, and how we, ha how we develop, uh, we, we, we saw the different sites, all the different farms, and how can we share that, that good practice, and how can we effectively put in plans from our knowledge of what we've done um, if you do get caught in a, uh, an outbreak to carrying that through into making it a much more effective and efficient delivery service for everybody concerned, government, ourselves, and our industry partners. So that said, um, we do work uh, across the board with a number of organizations, uh, both uh, domestically and internationally. Um, we've recently just completed a project with the National Port Board in the U.S. Um, on one of, our, one of our products, but we really take the welfare aspect of our products very seriously. How uh, there is more and more focus from welfare, welfare and action groups on depopulation and animal, uh, animal handling. So one of the key things for us is actually doing the research on the product, on the, on, on the killing methods, to make sure that actually we have the data, the scientific data behind everything to prove that actually what we are delivering is a welfare-friendly uh, depopulation or a welfare-friendly service. It's not just a case of building, building a space, filling it with gas, and, um, and saying, well, yep, that worked. We, do, we, have, we have all of the, the, the research papers behind it to prove um, the times, uh, the, the effects on the animals, uh, and actually, what is the what is the the, the, uh, the the culling aspect of it? What is actually causing the death of the animal? So, really, very much, we run we run a lot of services around disease, trialing people in the event of practicing a disease outbreak. I know it's not something we all want to think about, but really, very much a case of the, the more you trial it in a, a peacetime environment, the more effective and the more things that you'll understand how that, how that works for, the, for you as a business. So, uh, as I say, live tech, we're, we're, we're a lot more than simply a, a, depopul a depopulation service. Um, the, the, one of the key starting points for us is um, on the, uh, sorry, I'm just two things, is the contingency planning aspect. Now, you're all doing it. 
Um, and everyone, everyone I go to says, yes, we've got a contingency plan. And I think the key thing for us is to differentiate between a contingency plan and a business continuity plan. Uh, so the contingency plan, uh, every farm is unique. Its location, its position, its access, they are all unique, unique factors. And nobody knows that farm better than the actual farmer themselves. Um, and I think that's the key aspect of contingency planning. It's knowing that you're doing um, in the environment, how would you, in the event that something happened on farm, how would you deal with it? If something happened around your farm, how would you deal with it? Um, and there's a lot of factors that you can't control, but there are many factors that you can control. So one of the key things from, from our, our uh, experience is actually is to do the, the the appropriate risk assessment to look at the, the location of the farm, the access, the layout, the, the other factors that could impact, the, add elements of risk, things that you might not be able to do anything about. You may have a, a, a neighbour or a farm next to you that, that has something that could, in, could actually exacerbate a disease situation. You can't do anything about it, but actually what you can do is try to put mitigation in place. Uh, the biosecurity plans. Many people think that that's just a case of foot dips or access control. But actually, what can you do to control the, the – what measures can you do to control a potential disease incursion onto your site? Um, in the event that you are then – that a disease enters the area, how are you going to respond to it as a business? How are you going to escalate the control mechanisms? How are you going to mass manage those aspects of it? They're all very key and, and essential parts because these, this, even if it's not your farm that is affected, it could have a financial impact with restrictions that are put around you. One of the key things that we, we, we do as, as having the depopulation and having done disease depopulation, outbreak of depopulation, is actually having the, the farm's own response plan. The first time I'll see the farm, potentially, if, if they don't have a contingency plan with us, is when we turn up with our equipment to depopulate. We'll have, uh, we will, uh, the vet turns up on site and we'll take some pictures. If there, is, if there is already a plan in place, if the farm has already thought about how it would depopulate cost effectively and expedite that delivery, that's an essential part um, of, of the process and a, and a key part of delivering a successful a return to business. And once that has been expedited, then how do you clean and disinfect that site to get it back into full production? There's no point in actually that you're already at a very high stress point when your site is, 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 is struck with a disease. Um, and then you're trying to deal with um, all of the necessary requirements to get your site back into production but if you've already thought about that in advance, you can simply bring the plan out, you know what you're going to do, and it makes uh, your, your return to production much more effective and much quicker. And that's why we really advocate contingency plan is the first place to start on, on the process of, uh, of ensuring uh, successfully dealing with uh, a disease, a disease outbreak. Um, and that's, that's not just a, a, a someone else's responsibility. So, um, as Matt said, we are, we are one of the contractors that provide the UK government with depopulation services. So, when I get a phone call from, from uh, Matt and his team that says, unfortunately, we have got, uh, we've got a, a, an outbreak situation, what are the things that we then do as a commercial organisation to consider how we will deliver that um, uh, in, in the most effective way? Well, I think the one thing that all of, these, all, of, all of this time has taught me is there is no single solution that I have been able to use on every site. Um, and that has really driven um, our product development in terms of how, how live tech approach um, on-site depopulation. One of the, the key factors is uh, what, what species are we dealing with? Um, are we dealing with... Uh, egg-laying birds, are we dealing with breeder birds, are we dealing with meat birds? Um, what's the, what is the access to the site? What's the, uh, what's the environment like? 
are the, are the organic free range? Um, have they got small? How do we how do we manage to, to do that in, in, in a way that makes it cost effective, fast, and eradicates the disease? So we have developed everything from the LiPEC Nex, which is a, a single mechanical net dislocation device, right to containerized gassing units uh, for small scale or small buds or specialist buds right up to a full range, a full size, um, uh, that take a full transport module. Uh, we can then plan that the, the, the population. We know how long, how many bugs we can do uh, at a time. We know the, the sequencing of it. Um, and we have got automation and control systems. So one of the key things, it's, it's very easy just to eradicate the bugs. In two of Two months time, someone comes and says, so what did you do and how did you know it was welfare friendly? How do you, what's your monitoring system? So we have developed our, our own unique smart metering system that records data, validates data, uh, monitors the, uh, the levels of gas that, that um, the animals have been uh, exposed to, how long they've been exposed to that gas, and actually makes sure that what we do meets legislation it's got audible alarms if we go above certain oxygen levels. It's got uh, the data recording. So each and every cycle that is undertaken is recorded on that device and can be downloaded, presented in a secure file. We also have two uh, full house gassing solutions. We have our nitrogen foam system, which as you see in the picture, um, and we also have the, the carbon dioxide whole house gassing system. Again, both have their, their, their places and both have their advantages. With the nitrogen foam system, as you see, it's not snow, it is the foam. Where you see the foam, there is gas. Where, you don't, where there is no foam, you're in no, normal, uh, a normal environment. So it's, it's a very good way of dealing with uh, 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 certain uh, sheds that you can't seal or have got uh, things. This is high, uh, high expansion foam, so the foam uh, is simply a delivery mechanism for nitrogen gas. So the key thing for, for our, our aspect in terms of delivering uh, a service is, a, is actually establishing what it is that we need to do and how quickly we need to do it. So from that requirement, um, we are then looking at delivering it within the government protocols. So we are effectively contracted by uh, the agency and who are the competent authority for dealing with that site. Uh, Matt and his, uh, and his colleagues take control of the farm, and we operate under their, under their protocols. That means that we need to report certain ways, we need to deliver in certain ways, and we need to uh, manage the, the, the requirement to depopulate the farm and ensure that we're doing it to, uh, uh, in a safe way. We're dealing with disease that could be potentially transmittable to humans, so we need to have the appropriate respiratory protection as well as the appropriate uh, personal protection for the staff and putting in the appropriate protocols. There are three key areas that we need to balance. One is the requirement. How many valves, what weight are they, uh, and uh, what's, what's the location? So really very much a case of understanding what the job looks like. If we have doing a small specialist farm with two or three hundred, Buds are up to a full-scale commercial premise where we have got 44 sheds. They, they require a different solution. But then balancing that with the resource. So what equipment um, is best to do it? What is the, the, the cost of delivering each of those pieces of equipment, or each of, each of those methodologies, and which is the, the best way of, of depopulating? Um, as well as, actually, what manpower is required to deliver that capability. So it's looking at the personnel, it's looking at the equipment, it's matching that with the requirement. The key for us, as Matt said, we have got rendering capacity in, in the UK, but we have a, a, we have a, a number of rendering plants that we can, we can use. The challenge has always been that we always seem to get an outbreak at four o'clock on a Friday afternoon. Um, so I, I recommend that I turn my phone off at 3.30 on a Friday afternoon, but it, in all seriousness, um, it seems that Friday afternoon is the, is the key time for production, a uh, key time for notification. So you've already had um, haulage running their entire week's uh, scheduling 
um, and the downtime that they would normally have in the driver driver of recovery time, you're suddenly hitting them with a potentially a massive requirement to deliver on site. So we work with the disposal companies and the haulage companies to make sure that we are maximizing the, the haulage. So marrying the, the disposal requirement with how much carcass we're producing at the same time as what resource and what gas uh, that we require to deliver that solution. We present that in advance, we, we commit to a time scale to deliver, and then we deliver to that time scale from the experience that, that we have. So uh, it's essential that we do have the full, uh, all the tools available to us, not just simply saying there is one size fits all. Um, and especially when you get into certain factors where there may be shortages in carbon dioxide, which have happened um, uh, over the over recent years, or whether there's, a, whether there's a, a, a shortage or other people may be pulling from that requirement. So it's, it's quite uh, making sure that you've got that, that pre-planning done. So one of the key things um, in delivering uh, an outbreak is that we've notified of disease. We want to make sure that we don't, we don't accidentally or uh, allow that disease to spread beyond the confines of the notified premise. One of the key things um, for, for, for our uh, perspective is ensuring that um, we have three key elements um, of control. Uh, during um, the, the, the depopulation service, the site is, is put under restriction. Um, we instigate strict biosecurity controls. So we have uh, clean and dusty areas. Uh, we have access control points so that anyone who's entering the farm is going in in full uh, with proper protection, the proper P uh, and respiratory protection, that is removed at the control point, so the disease can't be taken up past that control point. That protects the staff. We're also looking at whether we have to issue um, medication, prophylactic medication, um, if the disease is, is that way. But it's ensuring that when we open the, the sheds or break into the sheds or actually expose people or the wide environment to the to the, to the affected buds, that we deal with them as, as easily and as, as quickly as possible. Um, and that also involves um, ensuring that we damp down. So we take we handle the buds once, uh, we put them into in the, in the containerized gassing units, we put them into transport modules, they're handled once, they're damped down after being gassed with a disinfectant, and then they're emptied into a, a bulker. Once we've once we've completed the cull, um, there's a preliminary disinfection done, but we wash down all of the areas surrounding the environment that we've been working in to ensure that we eradicate as much as possible any potential um, uh, of wild animals or bugs taking that disease further. Um, the government. Uh, also then put movement licenses in, and all of my equipment is, is put under a movement restriction as well, is licensed. So that's where tracing and tracking and auditability comes in as essential. So I'm, when my equipment is coming through, everything is cleaned on site, everything is washed down on site, there is no organic matter left when it leaves um, that, that site to go into my um, holding uh, position. That equipment is then quarantined, kept separate from our normal equipment for, for a period of four days, um, so there can be no cross contamination. That means if we do have a commercial cull, we're not taking equipment that's been on an affected premise to a commercial cull and can't taking that out. We then do a full secondary um, cleaning and disinfection when it gets back to, to, to base, so that everything is then effectively uh, re disinfected. It's a double check. We have full audibility and trackability, so we do the paperwork on site. Our meters and recording devices are downloaded, and we have that available at any time for inspection. Any staff that have been on site, we um, ensure that they are quarantined from entering any other poultry premise or coming into contact with any other form of, of poultry within a whole day period. Um, and then the, the the key impact there is then get undertaking the secondary cleaning and disinfection process. So 
working with farms to remove the infected litter, to wash down the, the farms, to then get the farm ready to return to, uh, to its normal business. Uh, business. And that's how, that's effectively a very quick run through of what uh, we'll do as, as part of managing a disease uh, from an operational perspective. Uh, I'll hand you over to um, Andrew, who has um, fortunately had the, the, the benefit of the, the Live Tech and uh, Animal Health Service. Andrew. Okay, thank you, Gordon. Um, yeah, I've been asked to give a, a, a short presentation on, on, on the effect of a high path avian influenza on our business, um, which I'll happy to do so. So good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever the time is across the uh, the, the webinar. I, 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 uh, I thank you all for listening for two, two or three minutes. Thank you. Just give me, I haven't got the contacts. Hang just one second. There we go. I thought I'd show you the, uh, the the structure, our business structure. This is following the the acquisition of Vernon Matthews some four or five years ago. Uh, Vernon Matthews is owned by a chap called Ranjit Singh. Uh, he runs the slaughtering plants and the further processing plants. And he also owns the feed mills uh, that were part of Vernon Matthews uh, under a business called Two Agriculture. Um, James Hook bought the breeding, rearing and hatching operations. Uh, and is under the, the, the banner of P.D. Hook Circuit Limited. And the Growing Farms is a joint venture between uh, Ramsey and James supplying the, 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 the turkeys to the, the, the processing plants. We're a big business. We do both turkeys and chickens as a, as a, as a, uh, a combined business. Uh, we do 110,000 turkeys a week uh, for 46 weeks of the year. And then the six weeks of Christmas, we do it to 1.6 million turkeys. We do about six and a half million chickens per week as well. Uh, that goes into other slaughtering plants owned by uh, uh, Ranjit Singh. If I click on to the next one, just give me a second. Okay. Uh, for some reason it's not working. Just give me one second. Okay, sorry. There we go. This is the uh, poultry register. Um, and, and identifies the, the population of poultry within, within Great Britain. Um, my turkey operation runs out of East Anglia, which I've circled in red, and it just shows how dense the poultry population is within East Anglia. So therefore, early detection and subsequent notification is, is critical, um, and it is important to have cross-company collaboration with other operators in the area uh, as to give each other heads up and early notification. Forearmed is forewarned. It's not whether you get it, it's whether where your neighbour gets it. Uh, and therefore, you've got to have good contingency plans fully identified and ready to be, to be implemented. This is the, uh, the impact of avian influenza. This is this after 24 hours. Uh, and obviously, high path avian influenza and turkeys is not a good mixture. We had two outbreaks uh, within my operation. One was a free-range farm. IP means infected premises, and the free-range farm in this IP was 34,000 birds. We had just short of 5,000 white specialities and 29,000 uh, bronze specialities. Round the IP, there's a three-kilometer zone, which is known as a, a protection zone, or a PZ, uh, and we had one farm in that area that was, that was entered the day before and that's got a capacity of 75,000 birds. We had to uh, trace the stock back from the, that, that farm uh, into our, our cold storage, and though that, that uh, product was heat treated and, and went into our cooked production. Um, if that product went into the fresh production, then it would have to carry a different health mark, which really no retailer of anyone wants, and it basically makes the birds worthless. So those birds were traced back, uh, and that product went into our further processing uh, facilities and cooked to, to maintain the value. The surveillance zone of the SZ is 10, is 10 kilometers around the infected premises. Uh, we had one stag grown farm, which was empty at the time, uh, that was due to take transfers in subsequent weeks, and that has a capacity of 97,500 birds. 
This is our other site. Uh, this is a farm called East Winch. Uh, the infected premises of the IP was a stag-grown farm uh, with 30,000 terminal, terminal birds. Uh, we'd already started processing some of these birds two weeks prior, uh, and that product uh, within the cold storage was traced and destroyed, uh, and we took that away from the, uh, from the uh, supply chain. Uh, within the, the protection zone, we had no other farms, but certainly within the surveillance zone, we had three sites. Uh, two of them were stag growing farms. One was just emptied, and the other one was a 33,400 unit. The birds were up to 15 weeks of age, and were due to be processed in five weeks' time. We also had one breeding farm, 10,000 hens and 500 stags uh, tied up within the, uh, within the surveillance zone. The business impact, uh, massive, uh, particularly that time of year being, being Christmas. Um, I'll, get, I'll, I'll go on to the effects of Christmas production uh, later down. But basically, you need a license to move anything, uh, whether it's people, kit, stock, um, that needed the license. Um, the, the slides just explains the, the uh, time consuming and, and thorough trace requirements required, which is, it, it packs on business uh, efficiency and, and, and delivery as, as licenses take time uh, and could take, particularly when the PZ goes up, uh, nothing is allowed really to move probably for about seven days until animal health uh, does the investigation and to ensure there's no other outbreaks. They wanted to know what the situation is. So to move birds to the slaughter plant uh, from a PZ or an SZ will, will require licenses. Normally SZs uh, or surveillance own birds moving from them or into those is, is reasonably quick and could take probably three days to get a license passed. Obviously birds to be transferred from or to a PZ on the grow on uh, and, and brood and move for licenses Feeds of birds generally is a general license, and, and that we had no issue with getting licenses to feed birds, and, and that was a, a, a credit to the to the animal health, um, as that was not interrupted. With, it, with regards the the uh, the breeding farm, we needed to license eggs from that breeding farm into the hatchery. But the first thing the hatchery needs is a designation, uh, and that's normally activated with a, a, a call to animal health and, and a confirmation by email, and then pre-agreed by security protocols or actions. So the hatchery then can accept eggs coming from an SZ. But the poultry on that surveillance zone in the breeding farm has to be inspected by a vet uh, 24 hours before any eggs are allowed to move into the hatchery. And again, that, uh, that takes time and it causes um, uh, inefficiencies within, within the supply chain. Fortunately, our hatchery did not fall into either of the zones, the PZ or SZ, but if it did, then all stock out of the hatchery will need to be licensed, and one then needs to understand how you're going to take care of the, of the hatch pulse. Uh, you can't stop hatching. Hatching is a, is, it will continue, regardless of whether a, a projection zone or surveillance zone is, is put in place. So alternative uh, places for pulse may well be re required uh, to keep the production going. The pulse out of the hatchery uh, into any surveillance zone or projection zone will need to be licensed um, if the hatchery falls within the zone or if the receiving farm itself is, is in those zones. All staff and all equipment, as Gordon has said, is, uh, is licensed onto uh, the infected premises, but also into protection zones and surveillance zones. And I'm talking here about uh, wash equipment, mucking out equipment, that all needs licensing, whether you're going into a, a Staff on the IP, uh, again, uh, public health is involved and public health requirements, so the need, need of Tamiflu and registering and logging of those people. And quarantine thereafter, including kit, which can take up to 72 hours. So it's, uh, it, all of this takes time and, and uh, it impacts on, on, on uh, uh, the efficiency uh, and the production of our, of our business. This process from a, a protection zone, as I mentioned earlier, requires a different health mark on packaging. Uh, so, it, and what we, we we have to do is look at birds taken out of a protection zone and go 30 days prior to the outbreak, and all of that stock needs to be traced uh, and and dealt with either by further processing or destroying, uh, which again affects the business uh, quite severely. Uh, birds require a veterinary uh, inspection. 
happen no more than 24 hours before slaughter. Uh, so if it was going to uh, uh, process birds out, the, uh, out of a PZ or birds out of an SZ, then a the veterinary inspection is required to take place to confirm that the birds are healthy and okay for processing. If the uh, birds are processed within uh, from the IP itself, as I mentioned earlier, then there's product recall implications and, and destroying of that product. Uh, fortunately, our Christmas production wasn't affected uh, by uh, birds tied up within the PZ or SZ, other than those birds already that were infected. Uh, but as our Christmas plan and production is normally 10 months in advance, uh, the birds are grown to a specific weight and they have time slotted production time within the uh, production plan uh, to meet the customer requirements of exacting weights and depot time arrival. So any uh, interruption of, of that supply chain, whether it's one day, two day or three day, could mean that we miss the slot. Uh, could also mean that the birds are the wrong weight, uh, they're too heavy or too light if we pull birds forward. And therefore we do not supply the customer the product they want and that could lead to penalty uh, for loss of supply which may well be incurred. So it's, um, and, all, and, and for all of this, uh, on individual farms, we need to uh, look at a track and trace for any possible hot link between the outbreaks, but also any link between an outbreak and also farms that are not in, uh, tied up within the, uh, within the PZ or SZ. So it's very complicated, uh, but needs clear and professional planning and tracking to ensure that we, we, we stamp this disease down without spreading it across other facilities. Journey back to normality. Um, the, the PZ will merge into an SZ uh, 21 days after the first cleansing disinfects. All zones will remove nine days after the above merger. However, this is subject to animal health clearance and guidance, uh, and there's no other further outbreaks within the, within the zone. Country free status tends to be three months after the initial cleansing disinfect. Now the muck out and secondary disinfection process is, is down to us uh, and we have to get written and approved protocols uh, and, uh, and endorsed by Animal Health and DEFRA. What do we do with the litter? Well our litter, we, we moved to a designated pad. Uh, this was then covered uh, and bunded and it was also approved by the Environment Agency. Our wash water was, was, was collected, treated and disposed of through a specialist sewer uh, treatment plant uh, at great cost to, to our business. The Environment Agency uh, is involved in all of the above processes uh, and the equipment and on-farm staff, uh, including contractors, we need to ensure quarantine times are strictly adhered to and training was, was fully in place. We have two options in terms of cleaning. We, we, we add a clean to the European standard of clean. Uh, this means that uh, poultry production can be reinstated. Uh, if not, if we can't wash to that standard, then we, we can wash to a, a, the OIE standard uh, and poultry production can return within 12 months. The benefit of washing to an OIE standard as a minimum means that if you've got other agricultural operations on that farm, whether it be arable or cattle, that can continue, uh, but you can't obviously continue with poultry production. So our aim this year uh, following the, the outbreak was to, was to complete our hygiene to the European standard, uh, which we just finished. Um, it took us four months from the first disease outbreak to now having it fully signed off, which happened this Friday at, the, at our East Winch farm. So that farm will soon be back into production. But there's a four month gap. What do you do with the uh, supply of, of, of poultry that was due to that farm? That also that has to be diverted and, 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 and to other, uh, other facilities and other changes that are making place in the, in the supply chain to make sure that jobs will, will continue to roll. So that's what I mean by tidy up upstream production. Uh, we then need to put the birds back to the right farms. So our agricultural plans, which are an 18-month rolling plan for turkeys, uh, needs to be uh, uh, back on track, and that's what I mean by tidying up the upstream production. 
We also then obviously speak to our retailers and build confidence back, uh, so they, they 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 feel as though uh, we're on, we're in control, and we maintain a supply chain integrity, but also have a joint understanding of the risks uh, that growing poultry, particularly in densely populated poultry areas, what the risk of avian influenza could uh, end up. Lessons learned. Um, I've got I've got. I've got to say I, 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 we are very grateful and, and thankful for a, a, an efficient, professional, and targeted response from both uh, Animal Health and LifeTech. Uh, they uh, ensured that the pain we went through uh, was limited um, and uh, we returned back to normality as, as quickly as we can. But there are some lessons to be learned. Uh, we need to continually review our, all of our AI contingency plans. We need to ensure that the poultry register is fully updated. This is, should be an annual process with the correct TPH number. TPH number is county parish elder numbers, which is a, a, specific, a specific identification code for each farm. And in peacetime, have designations in place for site-specific lookout and washdown protocols, and have documented procedures fully engaged and endorsed by all pa respective parties. So the company, that's us, the uh, Animal Health Environment Agency, approved contractors uh, like LifeTech, but also involve public health and, and the transport agency. So we can speed up the process of returning back to normality quicker than we did this, this outbreak. This outbreak, uh, we had the, the disease, and then we sat around the table with Animal Health and respective parties to agree the next steps of, of secondary cleansing and effect. This should, should be already agreed, site specific, by site, so we can uh, endorse an action straight away once the birds have been removed. Ensure that appropriate animal health staff are fully updated within aspects of our turkey operation. This could involve walk the chain, toolbox talk, joint, joint learning exercises. To understand that turkey operation is a brood and move, not like chicken. Uh, and turkey is not a big chicken. It is a, it is a, a unique species, uh, and the training needs to, 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 to incorporate that. Ensure contractors are awarded to, be co to competent operators who, are who have adequate equipment and logistical skills to run an efficient and bird welfare-friendly culling operation, which is exactly what we got from, from LifeTech. Rapid detection, culling, control and return to, to disease freedom is, is what we all want. So again, dealing with uh, uh, high path avian influenza, it's, it's really, it's, it's right in the rapids. Uh, I'd be rapid detection, rapid reporting, rapid diagnosis, rapid confirmation, rapid culling, rapid control, rapid return to disease freedom uh, is, is what we're all looking for. So that basically is a, 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 a a rapid, I guess, presentation of what uh, the, the impact of avian influenza, high pop avian influenza, was had on, on my business. I've been in it 41 years. I've seen uh, IPAP now three times. It's devastating. Uh, we love our birds, we love our turkeys, we love our chickens, and we do not want to see this uh, hit our birds. But we are fortunate to have uh, the animal health uh, operations to, to guide us through but also the, the, the efficiency of, uh, of life tech in dealing with the problem. So I don't know why I end this. I, I can continue to talk. I might sing you a song, tell you a few jokes, but maybe someone will come <laughs> and rescue me. We're going <laughs> to go ahead and um, answer a few questions. Um, we have a little bit of time, so let's see how many we get through. Um, the first question is, is your centralized control center similar to the United States Incident Command Post? Uh, the, ans the answer is yes, it is very similar. Um, the uh, DEFRA contingency plan um, sets out in much more detail um, the interactions between each of those um, uh, parts of the response. Um, and again, that's available in uh, uh, in a link in uh, in the back of my presentation, Liz. Okay. So, Matt, there's another question. Are trucks escorted by law enforcement or a member of the response team? Uh, so, generally, it will be a member of our response team. Um, law enforcement would be our, our last option. They've got better things to do 
uh, in relation to um, policing work. Um, but if we had a very large outbreak, uh, there's nothing to stop us using the police force. Um, at first, we will use trained officers within, uh, within APHA to do that. And um, each escort officer or escort driver is given a, a pack of information uh, which they're required to read uh, and, and sign off that they understand before they undertake the role. And um, basically, they uh, follow the truck and look for leaks or drips. Uh, in the event of a road traffic accident, uh, they will work with the first responders to identify uh, what needs to be done in the first instance. And the thing we do drive home is that human life will always take precedence, uh, but then comes the animal disease control. So if there was a, a, a spill on the road, um, our uh, escort will uh, pull the lorry over, um, then secure the air in, area in a safe manner uh, until we can get our response teams in. If there was uh, an accident which involved human um, life, uh, we'll escort the ambulance in, uh, get the human issue dealt with, uh, but then we'll look into the um, post um, uh, post activity that's required, so around the uh, decontamination of the vehicle or, the, or, the, or, or anyone who entered the diseased area. The next question is, will the UK continue reporting outbreak suspicion and confirmation information through ADNS for both Great Britain and Northern Ireland? Uh, that's a really good question. So a ADNS is the uh, European system, the Animal Disease Notification System. And while the UK was a full member of the EU, uh, we were required to um, provide input into that system within 24 hours of declaring a disease outbreak. Now, um, as we've gone through the uh, end of what we call the transition period, so officially now the, e, uh, the UK is, com is out of the EU, uh, there is a slight caveat though, um, particularly with Northern Ireland. So Northern Ireland will still continue to use ADNS uh, to enter the, um, the real-time information about disease response from Northern Ireland's perspective into ADNS, uh, whereas the UK, uh, uh, Great Britain will use the established OIE system, um, and there's an update or an upgrade coming to the system that we would use um, around uh, WAHIS, the World Animal Health um, Information System, and um, the plan is, is that the ADNS system will also um, provide links into WAHIS, so it will still give us that early warning um, when disease out recurring. Um, we, are, we have a very close work relationship with the EU, so um, we, we inform them through other channels as well uh, when we have a suspicion or an actual real-time response to the disease outbreak. Thanks, Liz. So the next question is, does the UK distinguish between depopulation and euthanasia for managing FADDs? And if so, who has authorities to make decisions as to methods to be used? Uh, can I confirm first uh, what FAD is? Born animal diseases, I'm sorry. Uh, okay, yeah, no. Um, so when there's a legal requirement on the keeper to report suspicion of disease to us, and that includes um, your foreign animal disease, we call them exotic diseases, and uh, once that is reported to us, uh, we will um, undertake a veterinary investigation. And uh, if uh, we will restrict your holding and we will draw official samples. And if those samples test positive, then uh, it is, it, it's government and APHA which will direct the next steps that must happen. So as far as um, euthanasia is concerned, um, animals potentially could be euthanized before we've declared disease. Uh, but once the disease is declared, we, uh, we as government will take over and then we'll apply what we call our depopulation um, operations. Um, our welfare at time of killing legislation is quite clear in what methods are and aren't approved and again, um, I mentioned because we're sort of transiting away from EU re regulations and requirements, uh, but we've, we're still very much built into our system how they operate. So um, 
we would look in the first instance to use an approved method of culling. So I mentioned we have a case officer assigned to an infected premises, but we also assign a, a welfare vet. And that welfare vet and the case officer will assess the situation on the, on the farm and determine what the best culling method would be. Um, and from there, we would then organise that um, to be delivered under our supervision. Um, there are instances where disease may have a very, very uh, tight or hard stronghold into the country. And if we think about a reasonable worst case scenario, so potentially if we were dealing with a H5N1 uh, Asian strain of high pathogenic avian influenza, and it was out of control in the UK, we could potentially look, uh, in England at least, to use a non-authorised um, method. So the European legislation does provide for the fact that if you've got a situation you've never dealt with before and it's out of control, you could potentially use other methods of culling. So in the event that we had high pathogenic avian influenza, H5N1, Asian strain, and we had exhausted all of our other culling methods, we could look to apply derogations to that um, to the culling requirement. And one of the derogations we, we have at, at, in our armament, which we've never deployed really, is something called ventilation shutdown. Uh, it's a highly political um, and highly controversial, really, um, method of, of culling, uh, but it's something that we need to be uh, have up in our um, our armory should that sort of situation ever present itself. Okay, I'm going to take this last question, but for everybody else that has submitted questions, these questions will be sent to the presenters for them to address. Um, the last two questions, is epidemiology indicating most of the outbreak is coming from wild birds directly or spreading laterally? Uh, it is a little bit of both. So we know that the avian influenza is flying into the United Kingdom, um, particularly from um, Eastern Europe. Uh, through migratory wild birds, and uh, we do know through our um, epidemiological analysis of the uh, the dead wild birds that we're reporting that initially we saw a lot of the migratory bird species um, being reported, but then over time that gradually starts to reflect the non-migratory wild birds within the United Kingdom. And um, over the last few months, we've uh, detected less and less wild bird findings, and that is um, resulting now in us reducing our um, risk status uh, from a, a very high level down to a, a medium level. Um, it still requires people to comply with security requirements, and what we're, we're seeing and expecting is that the uh, migratory wild birds will take off uh, back to uh, Eastern Europe and we're likely to see another wave of, of avian influenza infections um, as they move out. And then over time, as the domestic wild birds of the UK recover, and then also as our, our, the, the virus decays in the environment, we'd expect then to see less reports within our domestic poultry. And the last question is, are producers using a published decision tree to make depopulation method decisions? And who has more role in the choice, DEFRA or the owner? Certainly as far as an infected premises is concerned, um, it is it's government that has the direct control over what depopulation method could be applied. Um, there are certain circumstances where there will be um, non-notifiable um, disease outbreaks, which a producer can choose to make a commercial decision in relation to how they depopulate. Um, those depopulation methods, again, must be compliant with our welfare at time of killing requirements. Um, there is provision uh, in that uh, legislation, though, to allow a keeper to uh, propose to kill their birds on site, um, either using uh, a containerised gassing system or using a whole house gassing system. And in those situations, uh, the keeper needs to advise APHA at least five days in advance, and then we take a uh, risk-based decision as to whether we're going to um, audit the, uh, the, either the producer or their contractor in relation to how they're delivering that depopulation service. That's great. 
First of all, let me thank all of the presenters. This presentation has been great. We really appreciate your time that you've taken out of your busy schedules to do this. Um, I will be sending any additional chat questions to the presenters with your emails for answers. Um, so, and thanks to everybody. We had a great response for this webinar today. We have another webinar scheduled for Thursday, April 1st at 1 o'clock Eastern Standard Time, and the topic is an overview on lumpy skin disease. And with that, I bid you to have a great rest of your day. And that concludes our conference. Thank you for using event services. You may now disconnect.